Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all themes, Outlander from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is podcast episode 135, and we're in week 21 of the Drums of Autumn read along. Hello! I'm so happy to be with you today. And there are some big news that came down this past week. Outlander Season 4 is set to premiere sometime in November 2018. So one of those Sunday nights, your guess is as good as mine. I haven't looked at the schedule coming up on Stars to figure out the premiere night. But what I think will happen is whatever show ends in that slot, then the prior week there will be replays of seasons one through three on stars for people to rewatch and catch up and then we'll have the premiere so season four has 13 episodes and of course it's based on drums of autumn that's why we're doing this read-along and the show has also been renewed for seasons five and six so this is twice now this has happened to outlander where a double season sign up has been done. Those renewals are very rare and Outlander is pretty much the cash cow for stars, which is my guess. The difference is, is that seasons five and six will have 12 episodes instead of 13, but I think that's going to be okay. Uh, Season five is expected to be adapted from Fiery Cross, which is book five, And season six from A Breath of Snow and Ashes, which is book six. And yes, there will be read-alongs for both of those. So you get to stick with me a little while longer. And even if the show didn't get renewed, which nobody believed that would happen, I would still do the read-alongs. And there's so much Outlander material out there. Why not? There's no reason... The podcast only has to be about the TV show, but I'm really glad we have the TV show to go with it. So Fiery Cross has a huge chunk that is based on a short time period. Sometimes Diana Gabaldon writes that where in that 24 hours, a couple of days, etc., there's an incredible amount of detail that is laid down. And Fiery Cross is one of those books. So though it's really long And it's going to take us 10 months to get through on a read-along. I think in the visual medium, it'll be pretty easy to adapt the material and pare it down. Because in the book, you have to see what's going on with all these different characters. On screen, you can actually see what's going on. And so it can be condensed quite a bit. So I'm very, very excited. And... So as soon as season four ends, we'll be starting the Fiery Cross read-along in 2019. And I will have a date and kind of the layout of the read-along after we know exactly when it premieres. And the other part of that is it means we're going to have time when this read-along is done to do another novella or two. So that's really exciting. So if you have an opinion on what novella or other Outlander-related book you would like me to do, drop me an email at contact at adramaoutlander.com or leave me a voicemail at 719-425-9444. I will also put up a poll on the Facebook page and group as well as on Twitter. So it's a Dram of Outlander on Facebook, Dram of Outlander without the A in the front on Twitter. Yes, I want to hear from you and what you would like. And the summary for chapter 40 goes something like this. Virgin Sacrifice Brianna and Lizzie make it to Wilmington. The girl has been sick with fever multiple times. The next step is Cross Creek. Lizzie learns Jamie Fraser will be at his aunt's at River Run for a trial. Roger arrives mere days after Brianna in North Carolina and reaches Wilmington on her heels. He finds her. She is happy and upset. They are handfast in the Scottish tradition and consummate their marriage multiple times in a shed. Brianna learns the truth. Feeling betrayed, she storms back to her rented room. 
Roger vows to return to her. He leaves to secure a gemstone. Lizzie thinks Mackenzie, a.k.a. Roger, raped Brianna. Inside the Chapter Chapter 40 Virgin Sacrifice Wilmington, the Colony of North Carolina, September 1st, 1769 so it looks like Roger made very good time. And because he was going straight to North Carolina, even though he left, what, a month and a half behind her, he was able to make up all of that time. Brianna and Lizzie are in North Carolina waiting for Lizzie to improve from another attack of illness. Poor, frail girl is fevered and weak. They were riding from Charleston when the illness struck again. Brianna was terrified her companion would die in the wilderness, but pressed on to Wilmington the next day when the fever temporarily broke. Brianna needs to find her mother to help with Lizzie and for herself. Taking care of the girl helped Brianna appreciate her size and strength. Nursing is tough work. Brianna decides it must be malaria causing the fevers. Mosquitoes were a plague upon them once land was in sight. Brianna could feel her mother's presence as she cared for the ailing girl. If it were her mother speaking, though, next would have come the orange-flavored St. Joseph's Aspirin, a tiny bill to be sucked and savored, as much as, tri as much treat as medicine, the aches and fever seeming to subside as quickly as the sweet tart pill dissolved on her tongue. Brianna cast a bleak glance at her saddlebags, bulging in the corner. No aspirin there. Jenny had sent a small bundle of what she called simples, but the chamomile and peppermint tea had only made Lizzie vomit. Quinine and other derivatives were the chief medicines to combat malarial fever since World War II. Claire would use Jesuit bark, cinchona bark, in the 18th century. And I put a link in to the podcast notes. Jesuit bark or cinchona bark, however you'd like to call it, has a lengthy history and it was used because it the property is to bring down fever. And the reason that people died from malaria, which they got from being bit by a mosquito that carried it, is because these fevers would continue to come and they would weaken the person until the person just couldn't survive another attack. And poor Lizzie is a young teenage girl. She's very thin and she's frail. They've survived this ocean journey, and now they're traveling over land from South Carolina to North Carolina, and she's sick, and she's had multiple fevers, and Brianna's really worried that she could die in the woods on her. So Brianna figured out what this probably is, but she wants her mother to take care of it. She knows that Claire can fix almost anything. That's just what her mother does, right? When they arrived in Wilmington, the landlady at the inn called for an apothecary when she saw how ill Lizzie was. Modesty prompted her to step outside when the apothecary drew down the linen sheet to make his examination, and it was not until she heard a small cry of distress that she flung open the door to find the young apothecary, fleam in hand, and Lizzie, her face white as chalk, red blood streaming from a cut in the crook of her elbow. "'But it is to draw the humors, miss,' the apothecary had pleaded, trying to shield both himself and the body of his patient. "'Do you not understand? You must draw the humors. If it is not done, hot bile will toxify within her organs and fill her body entirely, to her certain detriment.' "'It will be to your certain detriment if you don't leave,' Brianna had informed him through clenched teeth. "'Get out of here this minute!' I'd say Brianna has mm, a bit about her carriage that would make somebody leave. <laughs> the man left with a fright and warnings. Brianna didn't exactly know how to care for Lizzie, but knew bloodletting wasn't the answer. She reflected on how the bugs stayed away from her, and she had had vaccinations for many diseases, including malaria before she went through the stones. She wondered how many other diseases were prevalent in the sweltering city and were caused by bug bites. Again, I have no ideas 
if vaccinations from 200 years hence would have any impact on a disease in the past because they do change and morph. These illnesses are not static, though some are very slow changing. So if it was close enough, Brianna would likely not get sick, but she could be a carrier, which is really terrifying. So we just ignore that here and move on. Exhausted, she was too tired to change out of the many days worn clothing. She knew she had to find her mother as quickly as possible to help Lizzie. The small maidservant could die from another round of fever. She planned to sell the horses and take a boat upriver to Cross Creek in search of Aunt Jocasta's house, River Run. The thought of meeting more family gave Brianna a thrill. Certainly, she would be able to tell Brianna how to find Jamie and Claire. And finally, she undressed and lay naked on the quilt on the floor, drifting quickly to sleep. The next morning, Lizzie remained weak but fever-free. Brianna paid the landlady extra money to keep an eye on the sick girl while she goes out to tend to the business at hand. Like she had to get those horses sold, otherwise she wouldn't have enough money to pay for passage, and they can't keep the horses if they're going by river. Brianna managed to sell the horses and obtained the name of a man who took people up river to Cross Creek by boat, but she was unable to find him by nightfall and the docks were no place for a woman alone. So she returned to her room. She found Lizzie dressed and eating. She is much better. Lizzie had been doing the washing and ironing. Brianna worries the girl will overexert herself and become ill again. When the girl explains the discovery she'd had, Brianna listens. Well, I did not think you'd be wanting to meet your da and clothes all spotted with filth. Not but what even a clarity gown would be better than what you've got on. The little maid's eyes passed reprovingly over Brianna's breeches. She didn't, she didn't approve at all of her mistress's penchant for male costume. Meet my da. What do you, Lizzie? Have you heard something? A flare of hope shot up inside her a sudden bright puff like the lighting of a gas stove. Lizzie looked smug. I have that, and twas all because of the washing too. My da did always say as how virtue brings its reward. I'm sure it does, Brianna said dryly. What did you find out, and how? Well, I was just after hanging out your petticoat, the nice one. I with the lace about the hem. Brianna picked up a small jug of milk and held it menacingly over her maid's head. Lizzie squeaked and ducked away, giggling. All right, I'm telling, I'm telling. So it was a man named McNeil who knows Jamie and Claire and Jocasta Cameron. Lizzie explains what the man said about Claire. Claire, you did say that was your mom's name. I asked, and he said, yes, Mrs. Fraser's name was Claire, and he said that she was a most amazing healer. Did you not say as your mother was a fine physician? He said as he had seen her do a desperate operation on a man, laid him smack at the middle of a dinner table, and, and cut off his bollocks, and then stitched them back on, right there on the spot, with all the dinner party looking on. That's my mother, all right. There were tears of what might have been laughter in the corners of her eyes. Are they well? Had he seen them lately? Hmm. This little maid servant has a gift, doesn't she? She got some great information. It turns out that Jamie is in Cross Creek because of an upcoming trial he must go to. Brianna starts calculating the time needed to get up river so she doesn't miss him. Roger arrived in Edenton just 10 days after Brianna arrived in South Carolina. She must be in Wilmington by now, and he is determined to find her. Roger details his journey to Wilmington. He had managed the journey from Edenton to Wilmington with a fair amount of ease himself. Put to work unloading cargo from the Gloriana's hold, he'd carried a chest of tea into a warehouse, set it down, walked 
back to the door and busied himself in retying the sweat-soaked kerchief round his head. As soon as the next man had passed, he stepped out onto the dock, turned right instead of left, and within seconds was headed up the narrow cobbled lane that led from the docks to town. By the next morning, he'd found a berth as loader on a small cargo boat, transporting naval stores from Edenton to the main depot at Wilmington, there to be transferred to a larger ship for transport to England. He jumped ship again in Wilmington without a moment's compunction. He hadn't time to waste. There was Brianna to be found. He knew she was here. She had to be. It was the most logical place to secure a guide to go into the mountains to Fraser's Ridge. He learns that there are 23 taverns where she could have taken a room or maybe in a private residence, he thinks. By the time he had reached the fifth tavern, people began sharing their sightings of her. At the same time, he scarcely noticed the physical discomfort. A man in the fifth tavern had seen her, so had a woman in the seventh a tall man with red hair, the man had said, but a great huge girl dressed in women's breeches, the woman had said, clicking her tongue in shock, walking down the street plain as you please with her coat over her arm and her backside in view of everyone. Let Roger get that particular backside in his view, he thought, with some grimness, and he'd know what to do with it. He baked a cup of water from a kind-hearted landlady and set off with renewed determination. By the time it was full dark, he had covered another five taverns. The tap rooms were full now, and he discovered that the tall, red-headed girl in men's clothing had been causing public comment for nearly a week. The quality of some of this comment caused the blood to throb in his cheeks with outrage, and only the fear of being arrested kept him from outright assault. <laughs> well, he's gone to the right place, hasn't he? And oh, Brianna, make it a splash. Sort of reminds me of Jamie Fraser, who can't go anywhere without being noticed and having people looking at his backside either. Roger was considerably worried for Brianna after hearing the stories. He was also hungry, thirsty, and lacking funds. He decided on a place to spend a couple of pennies on dinner, and maybe, just maybe, he would be allowed to sleep in the stable. He saw a newspaper office and wanted to throw a rock through the window. That damned notice is what got both into this situation. Entering the Blue Bull, he sees Brianna sitting by the hearth. Her tailed hair sparking in the firelight, engaged in conversation with a young man, whose smile Roger wanted to wipe off forcibly. Instead, he slammed the door behind him with a crash and started toward her. She turned, startled, and stared blankly at the bearded stranger. Recognition flashed in her eyes, then joy, and a huge smile spread across her face. Oh, it's you. Then her eyes changed as realization flared up like a brush fire. She screamed, it was a good full-bodied scream, and every head in the tavern snapped round at the sound of it. Damn you! He lunged across the table and got her by the arm. What the devil do you think you're doing? This is not starting out so great, is it? Roger tries to make her come with him. A seaman from the cargo boat yells at Roger, also known as Mackenzie, to let her be. Brianna finally tells the protective man she knows Roger. The man reluctantly backs off. Lizzie freaks out that Brianna may go with him and tries to hit him with a bottle. Brianna assures her it's okay and she'll be back later. Once outside, she wants to know why he's there. He takes her to the shelter of a tree. Again, she demands to know what he's doing there. Looking for you, you wee fool. And what's the name of all holy are you doing here and dressed like that? God damn you. He'd had the briefest look at her in her breeches and shirt, but it was enough. In her own time, the clothes would have been baggy as to be sexless. After months of seeing women in long skirts and erisse, though, the blatant division of her legs, the sheer bloody length of her thigh and curve of calf seemed so outrageous that he wanted to wrap a sheet around her. 
Bloody woman, you might as well walk down the street naked. Don't be an idiot. What are you doing here? I told you, looking for you. And where the hell else should I be? With you tearing off into fucking nowhere and risking your bloody neck. And why the hell did you do it? I'm looking for my parents. What else would I be doing here? I know that for God's sake. I mean, why in the hell did you not tell me what you meant to do? She jerked her arm out of his grasp and gave him a healthy shove in the chest that all but sent him staggering. Because you wouldn't have let me go, that's why. You'd have tried to stop me and... Damn right I would. God, I'd have locked you in a room or tied your hand and foot. Of all the flea-brained notions... She hit him a full palm slap that caught him hard across the cheekbone. Shut up! Bloody woman, do you expect me to let you go off into into nothing? And I sit at home twiddling my thumbs while you're having your womb paraded on a pike in the marketplace. What sort of man do you think I am? He felt her movement rather than saw it and grabbed her wrist before she could slap him again. I'm in no mood for that girl. Hit me once more, and by Christ, I will do you violence. She folded her hand into a fist and punched him in the belly, quick as a striking snake. He kisses her hard and tells her it will be all right. She is horrified he's there. Why? Why did you have to follow me? Didn't you realize? Now what are we going to do? Do? Do about what? She stared up at him through strands of tangled hair. Getting back. You have to have somebody to go to. Somebody you care for. You're the only person I love at that end. Or you were. How am I going to get back if you're here? And how will you get back if I'm here? Around and around they go. She has the temper of both her parents. Instead of throttling her back, he grabs a handful of hair and kissed her as hard as he could. She fought him at first, then gave in, ending in sobs. There it is. She didn't tell him she was going because she loved him. Now they tumble on the ground like wrestlers. He let go of her hair and she took her arm off his neck. But Roger couldn't stop touching her. He makes her say it. I love you, she said between her teeth. Got it? I have got it. He took her face between his hands very gently and drew her down. She came, arms trembling and giving way beneath her. You're sure? Yes, what are we going to do? She said and began to cry. We, she said we. She said she was sure. Roger lay in the dust of the road, bruised, filthy, and starving, with the woman trembling and weeping against his chest now and then, giving him a small thump with her fist. He had never felt happier in his life. She lay in his arms, weeping. They are dirty, bruised, and he is most certainly hungry. They will find a way back to the 20th century, somehow. She is happy to see him regardless of not wanting him to follow her. He asks how long she'd been planning the trip, though he probably knew the answer based on the changes in her letters. Six months passed when she went to Jamaica instead of Scotland to see him. Of course she had asked him to come with her, but he refused on pride. She kept dreaming about her fathers, Frank and Jamie. There was one dream that stood out. It had been night in the dream, somewhere tropical with fields of tall green plants that might have been sugar cane and fires burning in the distance. There were drums beating and I knew something was hiding, waiting in the canes, something horrible. My mother was there drinking tea with a crocodile. Roger grunted, and her face grew sharper. It was a dream, all right. Then he stepped out of the canes. I couldn't see his face very well because it was dark, but I could see that he had red hair. 
There were copper glints when he turned his head. Was he the dreadful thing in the canes? Roger asked. No. He could hear the cesaurus of her hair as she shook her head. It had gone quite dark by now, and she was little more than a comforting weight on his chest, a soft voice beside him speaking from the shadows. He was standing between my mother and the awful thing. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there waiting. She gave a small, involuntary shudder, and Roger tightened his hold on her. Then I knew my mother was going to stand up and walk right toward it. I tried to stop her, but I couldn't make her hear me or see me. So I turned to him and I called to him to go with her, to save her from whatever it was. And he saw me. The hand on his arm squeezed tight. He did. He saw me and he heard me. And then I woke up. Aye. And this made you go to Jamaica? It made her think that the trail of Jamie and Claire was lost after 1766. She figured to give it a shot. Maybe they had gone to Jamaica first. The Indies were for trade at the time. She began to search cargo ships. She found the Artemis with the Captain James Fraser that sold five tons of bat guano in Montego Bay on April 2nd, 1767. She explains further finding the solution to Jamie being a captain of a ship with known crippling seasickness. There might, but on April the 1st, a woman named Claire Fraser bought a slave from the slave market in Kingston. She what? I don't know why, Brianna said firmly, but I'm sure she had a good reason. Well, sure, but... The papers gave the slave's name as Temeraire and described him as having one arm. Makes him stand out, doesn't it? Anyway, I started looking through collections of old newspapers, not just from the Indies from all the southern colonies, looking for that name. My mother wouldn't keep a slave if she bought him. She'd free him somehow, and the notices of manumission were sometimes printed in the local papers. I thought I could maybe find where the slave was freed. She didn't find the freed slave, but she did find the death notice dated 1776, they are there early enough to warn her parents, she thinks. Roger understands in this moment why parents or a spouse would beat a child or a spouse. I'm so glad you're here. I was so worried you'd find out before I could get back, and I didn't know what you'd do. What I did do, you know. I have a friend with a two-year-old child. He says that he'd never in life condone child abuse, but by God, he understands what makes people do it. I feel very much the same about wife beaten just now. What do you mean by that? He slid a hand down her back and got a firm grip on one round buttock. She wore no underclothes beneath the loose breeches. I mean, that if... I mean that were I a man of this time instead of my own... Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to lay my belt across your arse a dozen times or so. She didn't seem to consider this a serious threat. In fact, he thought she was laughing. So since you're not from this time, you wouldn't do it, or you would, but you wouldn't enjoy it. Oh, I'd enjoy it, he assured her. There's nothing I'd like better than to take a stick to you. Now he definitely sounds like Jamie Fraser. <laughs> He was angry. He thought she'd found someone else because of her letters. He wanted to beat her because she'd made him think he'd lost her. She apologizes. Then she wonders, how did he find out she'd left anyway? He tells her about the boxes arriving and the last-minute conference that had kept him in Oxford longer than expected. She realizes he followed her even though he thought she'd found someone else. He touched her under her loosened shirt. Did she mean it? The unspoken words of her body tell him she did mean it. Then her words urged him. You said wife beating. He paused. The crickets had stopped again. You said you were sure. Did you mean it? 
There was a silence long enough to fill a heartbeat, long enough to fill forever. Yes. An Inverness, I said. You'd said you'd have all or not at all. And I said I understood. I'm sure. And as he touches her, she says, please, please. If I take you now, it's for always, he whispered. She scarcely breathed, but stood stock still, letting his hands go where they would. Yes. The tavern door opened again, startling them apart. He let her go and stood up, reaching down a hand to help her, then stood with her, hand in his, waiting while the voices receded into the distance. Come on, he said and ducked under the drooping branches. He takes her to a nearby shed. For a moment, Brianna thinks about Lizzie. Roger didn't know who that was and didn't care either. He had her in a safe, private place behind the inn. Before they go further, they are hand fast. This is a Highlands custom, because a minister will be difficult to find on short notice. Roger will not lie with her unless they are married. I, Roger Jeremiah, do take thee, Brianna Ellen, to be my lawful wedded wife. With my goods I thee endow, with my body I thee worship. Her hand twitched in his, and his balls tightened. Whoever had worded this vow had understood all right. In sickness and in health, in richness and in poverty, so long as we both shall live. He thinks, if I make a vow like that, I'll keep it, no matter what it costs me. Was she thinking of that now? She brought their linked hands down together and spoke with great deliberation. I, Brianna Ellen, take thee, Roger Jeremiah. Her voice was scarcely louder than the beating of his own heart, but he heard every word. A breeze came through the tree, rattling the leaves, lifting her hair. As long as we both shall live. The phrase meant a good bit more to each of them now, he thought, than it would have even a few months before. The passage through the stones was enough to impress anyone with the fragility of life. There was a moment's silence broken only by the rustle of leaves overhead and a distant murmur of voices from the tavern's tap room. He raised her hand to his mouth and kissed it. On the knuckle of her fourth finger, where one day, God willing, her ring would be. The hand fasting allows for marriage for a year and a day before a final decision is made to legally wed or be married in the church. And they take their hand fasted vows in the shed behind the Blue Bull Tavern. They explore each other in the dark of the shed. She reaches down and humor invades the exploration. Her hand slid down his own hip and up long fingers fumbling loose the flap of his breeches, groping hesitant, hesitantly and then more surely, gradually wrecking his shirt up to disentangle him from the layers of fabric. No, the beast is like a rope. Oops, stop laughing, damn you. Like a snake, no? Well, maybe a cobra. Gosh, what would you call that? I had a friend once who called it Mr. Happy, Roger said, feeling lightheaded. But that's a bit whimsical for my taste. He grabbed her by the arms and kissed her again, long enough to put a stop to any further comparisons. She quivered in his arms, but not from laughter. She was naked, and the feel of her amazed him. He remarks how he's never been able to kiss a girl without stooping down. Brianna's nervous humor invades again. He couldn't stop kissing and touching her to get undressed. She helps him out of his breeks and shocks him by reaching down to grasp him. His senses were filled with the tastes of her lips, the smell of her body and hair, and he asked her to let go of him for a moment. She has a bit too strong of a grip. Instead, when she moves to her knees, he is stunned. 
Christ, are you sure you want to do that? He wasn't sure whether he hoped she did or not. Her hair tickled against his thighs, and his cock was quivering. Desperate for engulfment. At the same time, he didn't want to frighten or repulse her. Don't you want me to? Her hands moved up the backs of his thighs, tentative and ticklish. He could feel every hair on his body spring erect from knees to waist. It made him feel like a satyr, goat-legged and reeking. Well, yes, but I haven't bathed in days, he said rather awkwardly, trying to detach himself. Deliberately, she brushed her nose over his stomach and down, inhaling deeply. She likes the way he smells. Like a big male animal. His coherency and blood leave his brain in quick order. She asks if she's doing it right. He thinks so. This is the first time anyone has done this to him. So yeah, he thinks so. He likes it well enough. Before he completely loses himself, he disengages, pulls her to her feet, and lays her down on the straw. Now he thinks about his work ahead. He has only tried giving oral to a woman once, but she smelled of Sunday church flowers. Ladies, as a sidebar, douches are bad for your vaginal flora. There should be no artificial scents. There should be nothing else about you except for your normal, natural, healthy odor. We all have one. And you are not dirty. If you are concerned that something is wrong, you need to go see a midwife or a doctor or a nurse practitioner to get assessed to see if there's some sort of imbalance going on. But you should be putting nothing on, around, or in your vagina to make you smell like Sunday church flowers or anything else. That is my vaginal PSA. Brianna did not smell like this. In fact, she drove him to abject lust. Instead, he kisses her on her lower belly in order to remain patient. Damn, he said. What is it? She sounded faintly alarmed. Do I smell terrible? He closed his eyes and breathed. His head was spinning slightly, and he felt giddy with a combination of lust and laughter. No, it's only that I've been wondering for more than a year what color your hair is here. He tugged gently on the curls. Now, here I am face to face with it, and I still can't tell. She giggled, the vibration making her belly shake gently under his hand. Do you want me to tell you? No, let me be surprised in the morning. He gets to his work, enjoying the myriad of sensations and tastes. He felt a quiver move through her into him. He asks if he's doing it right. Oh, yeah. You sure are. I so love that response by her. You sure are. <laughs> hey, some dudes are enthusiastic, but they don't do it right. I don't know, maybe some women don't do it right either. He wonders how exactly she knows he's doing it right. She simply laughs. They work through the awkwardness of her eagerness. Finally, she relaxes into him. He tells her he loves her. She simply puts her hand on his face and opens to him. At the point of no return, he takes it slowly. She urges him forth. And she asks if he is big. He thinks he's average and asks if he's hurting her a lot. She just needs stillness for a minute. I love that. This is written so well. She reaches down his back, touching his behind. And in a moment, she gives him the go-ahead. Okay. She whispered in his ear. She stiffened very slightly and relaxed. Stiffened and relaxed. He knew he was hurting her. 
did it again. He ought to stop. She lifted up against him, taking him, and there was a deep and bestial noise that he must have made. Now, it had to be now. He had to. Shaking and gasping like a landed fish, he jerked free from her body and lay on her, feeling her breasts crushed against him as he jerked and moaned. I call this maneuver the pull and pray technique, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> yes, yes, there are generally no sperm and pre-ejaculate fluid. However, it takes one highly motivated sperm, and the timing must be flawless. I don't know about you, but if you've ever had an orgasm, that timing would be real rough to be conscious of, to make sure that there wasn't even a drop of actual s semen with sperm in it. Mm -hmm. I think it's called parents when people use this technique routinely. Brianna declares her love for him. After they recovered, tangled together, they talk. All right, love, have I hurt you? Yes, but I didn't mind. Her hand passed lightly down the length of his back, making him shiver despite the heat. Was it all right? Did I do it right? She sounded faintly anxious. Oh, God. He bent his head and kissed her. Long and lingering. She tensed a little, but then her mouth relaxed under his. It was all right then? Oh, Jesus. You certainly swear a lot for a minister's son, she said with a faint note of accusation. Maybe those old ladies in Inverness were right. You have gone to the devil. Not blasphemy, he said. He put his forehead against her shoulder, breathing in the deep, ripe scent of her, of them. Prayers of thanksgiving. That made her laugh. Christ, yes. How could you possibly think otherwise? Well, you didn't say anything. You just lay there like somebody would hit you over the head. I thought maybe you were disappointed. <laughs> now it was his turn to laugh, his face half buried in the smooth damps of her neck. No. Behaving as though your spinal column's been removed is a fair indication of male satisfaction. No very gentlemanlike, maybe, but honest. <laughs> I love how they're able to have this open communication with each other. He asks her how he knows, how she knows things, and she tells him it's from a book. He is astonished she learned so much from a book. He tells her it's terrible books go around telling young women how to do sexual things. How else would she learn if not for books? Roger must check his Victorian Presbyterian thoughts on female knowledge. He tells her there's n more to it than what books can say. She's eager for him to show her more. When she woke from a light sleep, thinking about how they fit together, how he made love to her three times through the night, how sore she was and happy she was. She'd imagined it a thousand times and been wrong every time, there wasn't any way to imagine the sheer terrifying immediacy of being taken like that. Stretched suddenly beyond the limits of flesh, penetrated, rent, entered. Nor was there any way she could have imagined the sense of power in it. She had expected to be helpless, the object of desire. Instead, she had held him, felt him quiver with need, all his strength leashed for fear of hurting her, hers to unleash as she would. Hers to touch and rouse, to call to her, to command. Nor had she ever thought such tenderness existed as when he cried out and shuddered in her arms, pressing his forehead hard against her own, trusting her with that moment when his strength turned so suddenly to helplessness. Such a gorgeous piece of writing right there. Roger apologizes for them not having a proper wedding and proper bridal chamber to consummate their marriage in. She assures him it was very good for her. She reaches for him, but the little 
part of him needs a rest. <laughs> She's not the only one who might be sore. She tells him she's never been so happy, and if they never get back to their own time, if they're together, it's okay. He tells her he thinks there's another way and explains his trip through the stones and the diamond Fiona gave him. Gemstones might help steer the traveler. He recited a poem from the grimoire. Ares, my athame to the north, where is the home of my power? To the west, where is the hearth of my soul? To the south, where is the seat of friendship and refuge? To the east, from whence rises the sun. Then lay I my blade on the altar I have made. I sit down amid three flames, three points to find a plain, and I am fixed. Four points box the earth, and mine is the fullness thereof. Five is the number of protection. Let no demon hinder me. My left hand is wreathed in gold and holds the power of the sun. My right hand is sheathed in silver, and the moon reigns serene. I begin. Garnets rest in love about my neck. I will be faithful. Brianna thinks the poem and the writer of the poem, Galus Duncan, is bonkers. But Roger points out that insanity doesn't mean it isn't correct. The poem has old Celtic ritual and witchcraft within it. Roger doesn't think the blood sacrifice is needed, but the metal and gems might be necessary. He asks Brianna what she wore when she went through. The bracelet he gave her and the pearls from her grandmother. So he explains that the pearls are organic, but the bracelet was silver and there was gold within the pearls. They discuss the possibilities of traveling through the stones and how the gemstones may assist travel. They need to get a hold of some to help with their eventual travel back to their own time. The thing is, it is difficult to find gemstones outside of a large city, and the expense is too much as well. Roger has an idea of where he can get one, but he must leave immediately to have a chance at it. Brianna cannot wait for Roger there because she found Jamie Fraser. Roger wants her to wait instead of going to Cross Creek without him. But with Lizzie being sick, she needs to find her mother as soon as possible. He agrees, but asks her to wear a dress instead of her breeks. She concludes he's going to steal the stone and she doesn't want him doing it. But he says it's no big deal since the man likely stole it from someone else anyway. That dispute was ended by one more roll in the hay. Roger speaks some times later, saying he thinks he married his great aunt six times removed. It had just dawned on him that they are related way back through the Mackenzie bloodline. The method of birth control they used throughout the night caused him to think of Galus Duncan becoming pregnant. Brianna figures they are sixth or seventh cousins or something near that. But she doesn't care if it's nothing near incest. Roger couldn't give up the thought, though. I really hadn't thought of it. You know what it means, though. I'm related to your father, too. In fact, I suppose he's my only living relation besides you. He'd gotten used to being an only child himself. No, he isn't. What? Not the only one. Jenny, too, and her kids and grandkids. My Aunt Jenny's your... Hmm, maybe you're right after all. Because if she's my aunt, she's your umpity great aunt, so maybe I'm your... Gah! She let her head loll back against Roger's shoulder, the spill of her hair soft against his chest. Who'd you tell them you were? Who? Jenny and Ian. When you went to Lollybrock. Never been there. Uh oh. When Brianna learns that Roger hadn't been to Lollybrock, she wants to know how he found her, then becomes angry, realizing he had found the blasted newspaper article and never told her. She is in a rare fury. He tries to explain what he 
He tries to explain when he found it and why he hadn't told her. He doesn't think they can change the past. You can't change things, Bree. Don't you know that? Your parents tried. They knew about Culloden and they did everything they possibly could have to stop Charles Stewart. But they couldn't. Could they? They failed. Galus Duncan tried to make a Stewart a king. She failed. They all failed. He risked a hand on her arm. She was stiff as a statue. You can't help them, Bree. It's part of history. It's part of the past. You're not from this time. You can't change what's going to happen. He couldn't stand the idea of her being hurt. She felt betrayed that he kept it from her. It was not his place to choose whether she knew about the death notice or not. This reminds me of Claire yelling at Jamie sometimes. Roger digs a deeper hole for himself. Damn it, I was afraid if I told you, you'd just do what you did, he burst out. You'd leave me. You'd try to go through the stones by yourself. And now look what you've done. Here's the both of us in this godforsaken. You're trying to blame me for you being here when I did everything I possibly could to keep you from being such an idiot as to follow me. Months of toil and terror, days of worry and fruitless searching caught up with Roger in a scorching blast. An idiot! That's the thanks I get for killing myself to find you, for risking my fucking life to try to protect you. Mm. This is going nowhere good, very quickly. She is Fraser angry now. She pulls on her brakes whilst cursing him under her breath. She yells at him, tells him to go get hanged if he wants to, and that she is going to save her parents with or without him. An idiot. That's the thanks I get for killing myself to find you, for risking my fucking life to try to protect you. She is Fraser angry now. She pulls on her brakes whilst cursing under her breath. She yells at him, tells him to go get hanged if he wants to, and that she is going to save her parents with or without him. I'm going. Come or don't come. I don't care. Go back to Scotland. Go back through the stones by yourself for all I care. But by God, you can't stop me. And then she was gone. That is a terrible way to end things. It's not as if communication is simple in that era or finding somebody. People get involved in your problems. Think about the seaman who was trying to protect her in the tavern. Lizzie isn't sleeping when Brianna returns in a flurry of emotion. Brianna says she's fine, but from outside the window, Roger Mack can be heard. Brianna, I shall come for you. Do you hear me? I will come. Her mistress made no answer, but strode to the window, seized the shutters, and crashed them shut with a bang that made the room echo. Then she turned like a panther, striking, and dashed the candlestick to the floor, plunging the room in suffocating dark. Lizzie was frozen for a moment. She could see the change in Brianna's expression. Brianna looked as if she had the blood fury like soldiers had. She was a Highland she-devil. Lizzie asked in Gaelic if Brianna was okay. Brianna told her to go to sleep. Lizzie simply lay awake, worried what Brianna might do. Then she realizes Brianna is shaking, and she feels guilty for allowing her to be hurt. Brianna finally fell asleep. Unable to sleep herself, Lizzie slipped from the bed, opened the shutters, and began to tidy things up. She picks up Brianna's discarded clothing. They were filthy, covered with streaks of leaf stain and dirt, riddled with bits of straw. She could see it even in the dim light from the window. What had Brianna been doing, rolling about on the ground? The instant the thought came into her head, she saw it in her mind so plain that the notion froze her with shock. Brianna pinned to the ground, struggling with the black devil who had taken her away. She thinks Roger assaulted Brianna. 
She smelled Brianna's clothing, and it reeked of man. As she washed Brianna's clothes with lye soap, the water turned red. She's sure Roger took Brianna's virginity and thinks it by rape. And the last line in this chapter is, The rising sun oozed a sullen red through the hazy sky, turning the water in the basin, the air in the room, the whole spinning world, the color of fresh blood. So Lizzie has all sorts of things in her mind, and oh boy, has she got this wrong. But she has so little information to go by, it's a logical conclusion. Roger and Brianna fighting is no good thing with separate tasks ahead of them. Where do you think Roger is getting the stone from? The seaman had called Roger Mackenzie. Obviously, this is the name he is going by in the 18th century. It is the name Lizzie knows the dark man by, too. Who is Roger? The Black Devil. Will Brianna tell anyone she's wedded by hand fasting? Will she get to Cross Creek and meet Jamie in time? Four sexual counters in a night, pull and pray or no. Could she be with child? Will Roger get the gemstone? Will he return to her? And as a last point, I love how Diana wrote the whole scene surrounding their coupling. Roger is a man of honor. He wants all of her forever. Woo! Yep, we're getting in the thick of Roger and Brianna. And we're also learning a bit about how the travel works because they have to figure it out, right? So what's coming up next? Chapters 41 and 42. And you can participate by emailing me at a contact at a drama of outlander.com or leaving me a message at the listener line at 719-425-9444. I love to get your feedback. I do have an email to read in just a moment. And I also want to say a great big thank you to Ananda Buckingham for a contribution to the podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am saving up for a new podcasting booth. I have one now that I break down and put back together, but I will be building one that is a permanent structure. So I'm very excited about that. And every little penny counts. On that note, how can you support the podcast? Well, go to Facebook and join the A Dram of Outlander group. It has to be joined and you must answer a few questions. So I know that you're not a bot or a troll and that you really want to join an Outlander group. You can follow the Facebook page, A Dram of Outlander. On Instagram and Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander with no A in the front. And of course, the website is, drumroll, adramofoutlander.com. But I do want to hear from you. Please send me your feedback. What do you think of Roger Mack? I think he's amazing. Why anybody thinks he's boring, I have no idea. Look what this man did for this woman. And look at how he felt for her. Um, I mean, he's in his low 30s. He's a man of the world. He's a professor, but yet he was determined not to just bed her. He wanted to keep her for always, right? He wants to be her husband and her to be his wife in all ways. Let me get to that email. And this is from Meredith from Everett, Washington. And... Meredith, I hope things in life are settling down for you. Family can be very occupying. (laughs) So about Roger and Brianna, I can't say that I've ever felt much of a connection between them, not until at least the sixth book. I know that you can't have another Claire and Jamie. I wouldn't even want them to be, but I've never really liked them together. I think they're both great characters individually, but I don't quite feel like we're supposed to be rooting for them together, particularly in these circumstances. I do respect Roger for keeping the secret about her parents because he had plenty of reasons to do so, and I don't think he could have kept quiet forever. His worry about Claire would have won out long before the fire happened. 
but his hand fasting with Brianna that very night feels too much like he was wanting a guarantee that she was his, like he was locking her in, in the same way that Frank did by not telling Claire that Jamie didn't die at Culloden. Both Roger and Frank don't like losing the girl in favor of Jamie. I hope this show does a better job of illustrating the connection between Roger and Brianna. Ooh, Meredith, I had never looked at it that way. I think more it's his traditionalism, and he didn't want her to be a role in the hay. He loved her and never had felt anything for anyone else. I don't see it as him trying to claim ownership. And Frank didn't tell Claire, I think, because he worried that she would leave, but she agreed not to bring it up. Right? I think it's because Roger wanted to get married once in his life. He didn't ever want to get divorced and didn't want to, have to deal with all of that. And he wanted her to be sure that she wanted him for him. So interesting. What else do you guys think? Does this resonate with any of you all what Meredith is saying? That she sees a little bit too much of Frank and Roger? I think it's Roger just being a traditionalist. He is a pastor's son, you know. <laughs> and I really don't think Brianna would have had sex with him outside of marriage because she was a very good Catholic girl. But I like your take. Thank you so much, Meredith, for popping in. So one of the things that's super exciting about the upcoming Outlander fan panel at the Denver Comic Con is I have a whole bunch of books to give away that are Outlander theme covered. So I hope those of you who are in the local area of Colorado or nearby will come to the Denver Comic Con. And I know that in attendance will be Graham McTavish and Lada Verbeek. So you could meet them, not through our panel because it's a fan panel and we can't mix. But they will be at the Comic Con. So that's interesting. And I still don't have an actual date yet because of stars still being scheduled to show up at the Comic-Con. All the panels are not totally set for about another week. But as soon as I have the exact date and slot time between the 15th and the 17th of June, I will let you know. We're also going to be having an after party. Woo! So that should be great fun. And we want to get together with you Outlander fans. So, this is a great chapter. I love them together. I think Roger being a little bit older in his pursuit is that he really wants things to be settled. And he does want her for his own. I'm jealous like that. My husband, I ain't sharing with nobody. And I would not have wanted him to marry me if he wasn't absolutely positively certain. So, we'll see what happens next. And I thank you for listening. So until next time, Slange va.